Welcome to St. Paul's. On behalf of the family, I want to thank you all for being here to celebrate the life of our most precious Debbie. I'm grateful to you all for coming out. Just a little housekeeping. If you need the restrooms, you can go out this door down to the Great Hall or down this side door across the courtyard to the Great Hall. There will be a reception following and celebration in the Great Hall with music and lots of fun sharing our memories of Debbie. When the service is complete today, we will go out through the uh, columbarium and inter Debbie there. You are welcome to join us after following the family in there, or you could head to the reception hall uh, right away, whatever is suiting, suitable for you. We will have communion today. You are welcome to join us. All are welcome at God's table, everyone. If you would prefer to have a blessing, just cross your arms over your chest and we will give a blessing. If you need communion brought to you, please tell one of the ushers and we will bring communion down to you. We also have gluten-free available. Just let us know when we go to give you the bread and we'll make sure you get gluten-free. Before we begin, let's take a deep breath and center ourselves for our liturgy today. Please stand as you are able. I am resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life even though they die. And everyone who has life and has committed themselves to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see and my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in themselves and none becomes their own master when they die. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord. And if we die, we die in the Lord. So then whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors.
understand that we have run out of bulletins. We have a very full house today. Um, so I invite you to share with one another and also uh, in your the red prayer book in the pew back in front of you, you can follow along there beginning on page 493. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our sister Debbie. We thank you for giving her to us, her family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Let us join together in Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. This poem was a favorite one of Debbie's, and she asked to have it read at her funeral. It was written by Yehuda Halavi. He was a Jewish physician and poet who was born in Spain almost a thousand years ago. 
Tis a fearful thing. Tis a fearful thing to love what death can touch. A fearful thing to love, to hope, to dream, to be. To be and, oh, to lose. A thing for fools, this, and a holy thing, a holy thing to love. For your life has lived in me, your laugh once lifted me, your word was gift to me. To remember this brings painful joy. Tis a human thing, love, a holy thing, to love what death has touched. A reading from the book of Revelation. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who is seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God and they will be my children. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Gospel of the Lord. Greetings. All right, let's do this. All right. Even if I didn't get all the Legos I wanted. The day before my mom's brain surgery, I told my mom I had a good upbringing, and she responded by saying, even if you didn't get all the Legos you wanted. <laughs> she had a beauty with words. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we gather here to honor the life of an extraordinary woman, Debbie McNeil. As most of you know, my mom died peacefully Friday morning on March 8th, following a year-long battle with brain cancer. Mom's life started as the oldest daughter of Episcopal priests in Utah and Lake Tahoe before coming to Washington for college. Her dad, John Langfeld, AKA Grandpa Saudi, was an astrophysicist, archeologist, and Episcopal priest. He set the bar pretty high for my mom. And she raised it. In her 20s, she was called to ministry, a calling I'm sure that was heavily influenced by her father. My mother never finished seminary in the 90s. She chose to take care of my brother and I. Many times throughout her life, and more so near the end, she lamented her choice to not finish seminary and complete her life's goal. I told her last year that viewpoint of being a failure was nonsense. I told her she has already achieved that goal. Right now is proof. I told her she was a beacon in the community, a spiritual guide for the masses, and a teacher of the faith. Achieving this outside the institutional system of seminary was a different way of achieving the same result, I told her. My mom never had student debt, and she never had to wear that itchy white collar. My mom had horrible eczema, by the way. I call that a win. As I stand here, it makes me smile knowing that my mom finally managed to get me back on this podium. You see, it's been a long time since I've been here at St. Paul's, uh, for I was raised in this church. My mother was very adamant that my brother and I got Episcopal upbringing. This upbringing eventually turned me into the Buddhist that you see before today. <laughs> I think she wanted me to build a cross with the Lego pieces she gave me. Instead, I built the Buddhist starship. She laid out the path for my life as best as she could, and she couldn't have done it a better job. Funny how life always works out, despite the best laid plans for it. My mother had a natural gift of picking up strays and adopting people into the family. I have two god brothers, two god sisters, along with a plethora of other people over the years. The McNeil extended family is so large that we all had to wear name tags at the epic parties my mom liked to have. Speaking about epic parties, my mother knew how to throw a party, a skill I'm sure she learned from her dad, the priest. This is the largest party my mom has ever hosted, by the way, so <laughs> sweet. I guess it goes to show you that sometimes the biggest parties are the ones when the hostess is gone. 
Music was my mom's other calling, and she was addicted to teaching it. Throughout my life, my home was a music school. It drove me nuts. <laughs> so many students, holy hell, ugh. <laughs> when I was living at home, sometimes I would listen to her lessons from the kitchen. She would change up her entire teaching formula to meet the needs of her students. From autistic spectrum disorder to multiple types of dementia, my mother could teach anyone how to play music. That was her main instrument she played in her life. Now that my mom is gone, she will live on musically through me and through all her students and everyone that she has touched musically in her life. That's part of my legacy now, and it's part of the legacy that everyone that she has touched as well. And I'm proud to carry that flame. My mother was also a costume designer and dancer. Some of my earliest memories of me bored out of my skull during her ballet classes. <laughs> or me dressing up with the costume she designed for the Bellingham Ballet Company and the Western Theater Department. Obviously, this type of exposure led me to doing drag. <laughs> and two years ago, I did. I was in the Bellingham production of the Rocky Picture Horror Show as a dancing nun. Mom surprised me that Halloween night dressed as Mother Superior. I'm so thankful she was able to see it before the end. She, have must, she have must have been so proud watching me sing and dance on, the, on that sold out stage at the late night double feature Mount Baker Theater picture show. Again, probably not what my mom envisioned that I would, my first foray in costume theater would be a sold out show on the main stage of Mount Baker Theater, but hey, it worked. It was perfect. I know this is technically an eulogy right now, but while I have the spotlight on me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about living your life without getting everything you want. Time is the most precious currency in the universe. Maybe this is why my mom burned as bright as she did while she lived. This brightness attracted all of you. She was the light, and we are the, all the moths. And now that her light is gone, we still cling to the warmth that it still provides. This warmth is proof that my mom is still around. And if you want to get scientific about it, it's because nothing in the universe is truly destroyed. Nothing is lost. Energy and matter only change forms. Debbie will live on through us. We will carry her with us in our hearts. Her fire will burn on even after death. I remember telling her last year about ripples in the universe, something her father I know would have appreciated. I told her life is like a throne, uh, like a stone skipping, like a thrown stone skipping across the water. Ugh. <laughs> Dry mouth, sorry. S uh, skipping across the water. The ripples are what the stones leave behind in the universe, and eventually the stone will run out of speed and splash into the water. Every ripple the stone makes will make its own ripples across the surface of that water and those ripples will make their ripples, and those ripples will make theirs, so on, so on. That is what life is, a bunch of ripples in time reacting off each other. Until one day, the ripples will become so faint that they will become indistinguishable from all the other ripples in life. So when you leave this service today, remember, the, remember that the universe is a giant ocean of Legos, even the vast endless sea of everything, you, have, you will have times in life when you don't have all the things you want and all the pieces you want. But it always turns out all right in the end. Thank you for being here and being part of my mom's life. Namaste and God bless. In the name of the Redeemer, the creator, the Redeemer, and giver of life. Amen. Thank you so much, Patrick. Patty Callahan Henry wrote in her book, Once Upon a Wardrobe, I believed, fooled that I was, that because I knew this end was coming, I was prepared, that I would not grieve as I had, as if one can pre-grieve or get it out of the way. It's not true. Grief is the price I paid for loving fiercely, and that was okay.
because there was no other choice but to love fiercely and fully. When Jesus wept over the death, death of his friend Lazarus, he did so because he loved him deeply. We grieve Debbie's death and celebrate her life. We miss her and we will continue to miss her. She was a great human. Sadness is real and that's okay. The depth of our grief shows the depth of our love. Patrick and Debbie were able to read the Chronicles of Narnia once again over the past year. What a gift they shared. A surprising aspect of C.S. Lewis' children's stories is the fact that he chose to deal with death openly and frankly. In the Chronicles of Narnia, Lewis recognized and illustrated the basic truth of Christianity. In a fallen world, there is no real life without death. Aslan, the great lion, rescues all of Narnia and defeats the white wish, witch, not in battle, but through his sacrificial death at the stone table. Aslan willing, willingly gives up his life for one who has betrayed the community and in so doing frees Narnia from the power of death. For Lewis, death is not the, representing the end. It is more of a passage or a door to something else, a new existence. One of the most beautiful passages in all of Lewis's works regarding death appears in the silver chair. Then Aslan stopped and the children looked into the stream and there, on the golden gravel of the bed of the stream lay King Caspian dead, with the water flowing over him like liquid glass. His long white beard swayed in it like water weed, and all three stood and wept. Even the lion wept. Great lion tears, each tear more precious than the earth would be if it was a single solid diamond. King Caspian dies and all of Narnia mourns, even Aslan mourns. Yet death is not the final chapter. Aslan, in a symbolic gesture, permits Eustace to draw blood from his paw, initiating Caspian's resurrection. Through this act, Lewis underscores death's transformative nature. Caspian returns to life, although not in Narnia, Caspian is in Aslan's domain. Death, as depicted, serves as a mysterious transition leading to a new beginning and new relationships. In a poignant, poignant twist, Lewis conveys that it is only in death, both in the form of Aslan's death and even our own, that we have hope that the pain and suffering of this world is transitory. Debbie was the first person to friend me on Facebook once I arrived. My arrival was announced that I was coming here. We messaged about getting to know each other with excitement and wonder. Little did we know that our time would be so brief or that we would be walking together as Debbie headed home. Debbie's faith was deep and music threaded its way throughout all her life and our time together. One of the greatest gifts we can receive is to discover the thing that brings us bliss and revel in it all of our life. Dance around it in the room every day. Permeate our relationships with it. Debbie's music, along with her many other talents and hobbies, did just that. Music often brings us to tears, whether tears of sadness or joy. All those tears mean we feel it deeply. And all the music today was chosen because they were Debbie's favorites. We feel deep emotions when we're in the presence of beauty, and it's a lesson in vulnerability and soulful engagement. It's something we can all learn from. For, music, for Debbie, music had a sacred quality. For her and for us, as we listened to her play, 
bringing us closer to the divine. Some people say, and St. Augustine is attributed with saying that those who pray, t sing, pray twice. For Debbie, I'm pretty sure that it was more than twice. Debbie's faith held her. She knew where she was going and how she would join all those who have gone before her in her beloved Narnia. I can't help to think of Debbie's life and death as a song, a symphony of sorts, this last year being the last movement, the finale, her swan song. The ancient Greeks believed that swans sang a beautiful song just before their death. Even though swans are silent or not very musical for most of their lifespan. Myths, stories, and poetry sprang up using this metaphor throughout the centuries. In Plato's work, Phaedo, Socrates says, although swans sing in, er in early life, they do not do so as beautifully as before they die. He adds that there is a popular belief that the swan's song is sorrowful, but Socrates preferred to think that they were singing for joy, having foreknowledge of the blessings in the other world. Debbie's song may seem left unfinished, yet she leaves the final verse to us, our chorus, to sing. So whatever gift she gave you, whatever kindness she bestowed or love she shared or smile she brought to your face, Take that as your sheet music and sing her final verse in your life. Sing of kindness and a life well lived and blend in your own voice. Your dreams or hopes, your gratitude for life, even your disappointments. Sing her song and let it accompany a new life, a new love for you. British comedian Joyce Grenfeld once insisted, if I die before the rest of you, break not a flower nor inscribe a stone, nor when I'm gone speak in a Sunday voice, be, but be the usual selves that I have known. Weep if you must, parting is hell, but life goes on, so sing as well. I believe Debbie would tell us to sing on, sing on giving thanks for whatever gift, large or small, that Debbie brought to your life. You may have met her once or known her for decades. Do not lose sight of all the amazing gifts she shared even as we've lost physical sight of her. As Patrick so eloquently put, her fire will burn on even after her death. She was the light, and we are all the moths. And now that her light is gone, we cling to the warmth that it still provides. Amen. Please stand as you are able. In the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us proclaim our faith and say, I believe in God.
for our sister Debbie, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Debbie and dry the tears of those who weep. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. You raise the dead to life. Give to our sister eternal life. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our sister to the joys of heaven. Our sister was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give her fellowship with all your saints. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our sister. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Father of all, we pray to you for Debbie and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May her soul and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Again, thank you all for being here. And a reminder, everyone is welcome at God's table. If you would like communion, just put out your hands and we will give you bread. If you would like gluten-free, please let us know. If you would like a blessing, just put your hands over your heart. And if you need it brought to you, please let the ushers know and we will come down to you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as an offering and gift to God.
Please stand as you are able. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By his blood, he reconciles By his wounds, we are free. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets and apostles and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending And so, Holy One, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the, in the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Ruth, Miriam, and Hannah, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. His in Lord be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we pray in the language of our hearts. Our Father.
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. All are welcome at God's table.
Please stand as you are able. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that in your great love you have fed us with the spiritual food and drink of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Alleluia, alleluia, let us go forth in the name of Christ. <laughs> 